Hi, in this video we're going to look at some of the uh, geological processes that have changed sea level, specifically in the Quaternary period. Although they will have applied in the past, obviously for this topic we need to focus on the evidence that we see from the Quaternary. Now sea level change occurs really because of the growth and decay of continental ice sheets. Not oceanic ones, continental ice sheets. Now this can happen in a number of different ways. During a glacial period, ice sheets expand. That's the, the definition of a glacier. And as a result, water, which evaporates out of the sea, is then stored on the continent and can accumulate on the continent in large volumes. That large volume of ice, though, will have a mass that can also have an effect on the crust. But generally, during uh, glacial periods, we see periods of low sea level, and during interglacial periods, we'll see periods of high sea level. So where we get periods of low sea level, uh, we can get land bridges appearing, um, dry areas of land in between now separated uh, land masses. That's actually had a, a big impact on things like human migration around the world. Even to the extent that um, Britain has only existed as an island uh, for about the last 7,000 years or so. It was only once sea level started to, to rise after the last glacial period had finished that um, the English Channel was flooded and we were separated from continental Europe. Now there are two ways in which sea level can change as a result of uh, these continental ice sheets. The first uh, is what we call eustacy or eustatic sea level change. And this is a change in, in true sea level, or to put it another way, the volume of water that's in ocean basins. Now, the volume of ocean basins will change as a result of plate tectonic activity, but that's over a significantly longer time scale. When we look at um, the changing volume of water in the ocean basins for the Quaternary period, because it's so short, we're really just talking about water that's either in the ocean or in the continental ice sheets. The more water that's on the continent, as we can see from this animation, the lower the sea level goes, the less water that's stored in ice on the continent, the higher the sea level is. So during an interglacial period like we have now, sea level is relatively high. During a glacial period, sea level will be relatively low. The effect of this can be seen uh, around coastlines. This is uh, a map of North America. The light green uh, boundary shows the present day coastline. The light blue area is the coastline at the height of the last ice age. You can see that how much extra land there was, particularly up in um, in northern Canada. Notice as well, uh, Alaska is connected to, to Asia. That allowed people to migrate from Asia into the Americas. The green, or the dark green area then, shows the uh, coastline at a peak into glacier, where we have no um, continental ice and you can see parts of uh, America including some you know the whole Gulf Coast the whole of Florida would be completely submerged so eustatic sea level change as shown on this fairly crude graph mirrors the climatic changes we've seen with the hundred thousand year um, temperature cycles 
crucially, we can uh, see that at the present, we have uh, sea levels as high as they've been in the last 120,000 years. That will have an effect on the geology of our coasts. For example, we find features that were once um, on land, uh, like this, for example, this is a rear. So this is actually a river valley. The water you can see in this image is the sea. Um, but the sea can't erode uh, around corners like this. Um, it, it just simply can't do it. If the sea is going to erode uh, in at the coast, it tends to erode in straight lines. So this was a river valley, a low-lying river valley, when sea level was lower. A sea level has risen, the bottom of that valley has flooded, and we end up with this very um, meandering uh, inlet from the sea. One of the best examples of this uh, is in West Wales. This is a map of Milford Haven. If you look at the blue areas on this map, they, they are the sea. They are, they are tidal all the way up to Hanford West. Yeah, if you look how twisting and turning and how meandering uh, this sea inlet is, it can only have been formed by a river. There are even tributaries that join. Now these, um, these rears, because they weren't formed by coastal erosion, because there isn't the energy of the sea getting in there eroding this rock, they actually make superb ports. Most of our best ports, in fact, uh, like Milford Haven, are rears because they're, they're very sheltered. There are several others around uh, the coast, south coast of Wales and along the south coast of England. Can you find an atlas and see if you can spot any? What other ones uh, are there within this country showing us that sea level has risen? Along the coast, and particularly around the Welsh coast, we can find areas like this. This is uh, an image from uh, both in mid Wales uh, at low tide, a very low tide that's exposed this uh, amazing feature uh, on the beach. What you're looking at here are the stumps of uh, a forest. This forest is about 7,000 years old um, and grew uh, in this area when it was a low lying coastal plain, but it was land. Trees. Um, like this can't tolerate salt water. As sea level's risen, it's flooded this low-lying uh, area. Um, there's even Welsh mythology about it, Cantra Glylod, the sort of Welsh Atlantis, this land that was lost to the sea. Um, but this forest, which can only have grown on land and is now in an area affected by the sea, and this would also go off to places that uh, further offshore that um, don't get uh, exposed by the tide. Um, this shows us that sea level has risen. It's an evidence now for higher sea level uh, here than in the past. But it's not the only way that sea level changes. Sea level can also change by a process called isostasy. Now, the best way to think about this is uh, if the Earth is a, um, a fluid-filled balloon, thin, flexible cover with material underneath that can deform and flow. If we push part of that thin, uh, flexible cover, part of that skin down, perhaps with the weight of an ice sheet, that will uh, displace the fluid beneath it. The fluid beneath it will flow away from where the pressure is and bulge up in the area around it where there's lower pressure. If we then remove that weight, or remove that pressure from the balloon, the fluid flows back to where it was to get back into equilibrium of, of forces, and that pushes the uh, flexible skin out, or will push the, the, uh, the crust back to where it should be. So what we see is the Earth... Uh, Earth's surface, the height of the Earth's surface, changing in response to the weight that's on it. 
The growth of glaciers puts weight onto the crust. They're a regionalised area. Melting that ice removes that weight fairly quickly and the um, and the crust of the Earth's lithosphere can bounce back up. Remember that this has to happen at the rate that the mantle will flow because it's really the mantle that determines um, the amount of movement and the speed of that movement. This simple cartoon tries to show it a little. There's a proportionate response to the amount of uh, crustal depression that happens and the amount of rebound that occurs when the ice melts. However, the rebound takes longer than the melting of the ice. So rebound can, will continue uh, for some period of time after the ice has melted. We see from this diagram uh, that the ice on the left there has pushed the lithosphere down. But in pushing that lithosphere down and displacing the mantle, about 150 to 180 kilometers south of the end of the ice, we end up with this, uh, this raised area around the ice. It's what we call the forebulge. And that's where the mantle has been displaced too. So underneath the ice, the crust has gone down. Outside the ice, the crust has actually gone up. When the ice melts, to re restore equilibrium of forces, that depressed lithosphere has to rise, and that fore bulge will sink as the mantle flows back. This uh, world map shows us um, this pattern. We can see that the lithospheric rebound, the blue areas on this map, are really confined to northern Europe and northern North America and also Antarctica. The rest of the crust seems pretty much in stability. here. If we look though at the areas, particularly in North America, surrounding the area there where we have uh, large amounts of crustal rebound, so surrounding the areas that's blue and dark green, we have some areas of, sort of oranges and reds. Those are the areas that are sinking as the mantle there flows back underneath um, northern Canada uh, where that thickest ice sheet was. Now we see evidence of this around the coast and what we look for here is Features that form on the sea, so for example beaches, sea cliffs, that are now well out of uh, the tidal range, that are well above where the sea can get to. So around Hudson Bay there are some of these features almost 300 metres above sea level. We can date these using the organic materials in the beach, shells for example. So we know um, at what point these beaches were active and therefore can work out the rate at which they move, uh, have risen. Here's an example. We've got sea at high tide here, uh, with some cliffs of Jurassic limestone, and sitting on top there we have a, a beach from the Quaternary. Now we know that sea level at present is the highest it's been for 120,000 years. So C is not going to have been that much higher that we can see on those cliffs. It must be that the crust here has been pushed down uh, lower so that the beach can form and then as the ice has melted, this bit of the crust has lifted out away from the sea. Around the coast of Scotland, we, find, we see a lot of these features. Uh, often about sort of 30 metres above sea level. If you look on this photograph, 
you can see that there's a, a step, like a ridge, right the way around the beach there. Like I say, about 30 metres above sea level. If you look at it carefully, in person, you find beach pebbles, you find seashells uh, in this. But you can see it's vegetated. It can't be uh, an active beach. Now, isostatic rebound, this um, movement, uh, this vertical movement upwards, uh, isn't uh, a straight line. The further the crust is depressed, the quicker it will rebound. The closer it gets back to uh, equilibrium, to where it's stable, that, uh, that rate slows down. So it'll take several thousand years uh, for this to happen. Now, we still see this uplift from uh, the last glacial period. Uh, the Baltic, uh, northern Canada, uh, even Scotland, are bouncing out of the sea. They're still rebounding back to their equilibrium position. Okay. We can see that there are these two different ways that sea level will change during the Quaternion. There are two key things for us to bear in mind, though, when we'll start looking at the effects. Firstly, the scope of these. Eustatic sea level change is global. Isostatic sea level change is regional, it's more localised, because it's only the areas affected by the, the, the weight of the ice. Eustatic sea level, well, it, we have one common shared ocean. So uh, any change in sea level will be a change everywhere in sea level. The other thing to consider is the rates of change. Eustatic sea level change happens much more quickly because it happens in direct proportion to the amount of ice uh, that's stored on land. If the ice uh, is melting, the water goes straight back into the sea. If the ice is accumulating, it's taken straight out of the sea and held upon the land. Isostatic sea level change, though, happens over longer time periods. So we'll have uh, an isostatic change that may, may still be going on, or will still be going on, thousands of years after the ice has melted. Because the rate of isostatic change is controlled by the flow of the mantle, not how much ice there is there. Okay, lots to think about there. Next lesson, we're going to actually apply some of these ideas uh, and look at some uh, examples, both in Scotland um, and maybe further afield. I'll see you then.